Good afternoon. The uh, meeting of the uh, Baltimore County Board of Education Policy Review Committee will come to order. Welcome everyone here tonight. Uh, going to our uh, going to our new business. Uh, what is before us are a host of uh, behavior-related matters. Um, in the school year 2016-2017, the Policy Review Committee uh, reviewed policies 5550 and 5560 on three different occasions. On February 13th, 2017, the Policy Review Committee voted to move the policies forward to the board for approval. At third reader of the policies back in April of this year, the board re re removed the discipline policies from the agenda pending a public hearing. And in fact, a public hearing uh, was held on October 10th, 2017. So it's up for third reader in October of 2017, and then a public hearing is held in October. In its July meeting this year, uh, the board um, approved a motion to direct the Policy Review Committee to review the disciplinary <laughs> slash behavior policies to consider input from the Superintendent's Council and the newly established school climate, school behavior, and uh, a discipline uh, citizens advisory uh, committee. Staff is here tonight to provide an update on the work of the Superintendent's Council and the TABCO work group. Um, we haven't yet received anything, if there's anything coming from the Citizens Advisory Committee, but you all have pretty full binders uh, that you're not expected to absorb uh, this evening by any means, but the information needed to be compiled and it's there. Staff is prepared to discuss uh, its work and recommendations it may have. Dr. Knox, if you could please come forward and in introduce your staff. And if there's a remote in the house, we might be able to share that with Dr. Martin Knox and uh, uh, she can share information with regard to school climate and safety. eloquently stated. We're here to share with you information as it relates to student discipline and behaviors. Joining me this afternoon are members of our newly formed Division of School Climate and Safety. To my left, uh, there's Dr. Brinkley Parker, who is the Director of School Climate. And to my right, that's Mrs. Patricia Mustafer, who is the Supervisor of School Social Workers and the leader of the MTSS, also known as Multi-Tiered Systems of Support. So over the past few years, student behavior and discipline have been a topic of discussion, not only nationally, but at the state level. At the core of the discussions, we always keep in mind that we're talking about children and ways in which we can meet their individual needs, not only academically, but in an environment that's conducive to learning. Recognizing the need to support the educational environment, there are laws, regulations, and guidelines that have, le have led to the development of policies that govern how we prevent and address student misbehaviors. This afternoon, the presentation will include topics such as state and local BCPS policies, which guide our approach, BCPS framework for climate, and the multi-tiered systems of support. And at your desks, there is also a hard copy of this presentation for you to capture any information um, as we are presenting to you. So in a report issued to the Maryland State Department of Education entitled School Discipline and Academic Success, there are recommendations and guidelines that aid in addressing student discipline as it relates to suspensions and exclusions, as well as the disproportionate rate of exclusion from school for our children of color and students with special needs. This guiding document was developed from the work of several focus groups that were formed from stakeholder input regarding student discipline to the Maryland State Department of Education. From the research and collected data, there has been focus on maintaining an environment where all children can learn. The first recommendation that should be noted in the report is for the local boards to adopt a rehabilitative approach to school discipline as opposed to the zero tolerance approaches. 
In order to address the regulations and align policies with Comar, there have been several opportunities for stakeholder input within Baltimore County Public Schools. During the past few years, there have been public hearings on discipline. The superintendent has held listening and learning tours. There's been teacher, student, parent, principal, and business advisory councils. Community meetings have been held. Focus groups have been conducted in collaboration with the Teachers Association of Baltimore County Public Schools. Testimony given by the Public Justice Center and the Disability Rights of Maryland, and a stu Superintendent Council of Student Behavior and Discipline. Each opportunity provides stakeholders with a forum for their voices to be heard and recommendations for consideration regarding school safety, student behavior, and discipline. To continue with the previous work by Maryland State Department of Education, during the 2014-15 school year, local boards of education had the responsibility to adopt policies that must include a philosophy of fostering teaching and learning and teaching positive behavior, descriptors for keeping students connected to the schoolhouse, descriptions of the conduct that may lead to a school suspension. Additionally, providing the discretion for administrators in imposing discipline in contrast to zero tolerance practices in order to address ways educational and social emotional needs will be met. And finally, school systems were also to include information as it relates to suspensions for students enrolled in pre-K through second grade. At this time, Dr. Brinkley Parker will provide information as a preventative measure that has been employed by Baltimore County Public Schools as it relates to the BCPS framework for climate. Uh, good afternoon. Before you is the BCPS framework for climate. As Ms. White has emphasized since July of 2017, our framework for climate addresses the three major components that support schools in creating and maintaining a positive school environment. Encompassed with, within the concept of climate and culture, you will see prevention, which is a list of interventions and supports that are tiered to help students in making choices to interact positively with their peers and adults in order to be successfully successful socially and emotionally. This is the work of the multi-tier systems of support framework. Secondly, you'll see logical consequences, which are guided in our student handbook, and also show and allow for autonomy and flexibility for the understanding of student behaviors based on age the functions of behavior, as well as the individual assessment and investigation on a case-by-case -case basis. Logical consequences are a menu of reasonable reactions to students' behaviors, which hold them accountable for their choices while helping to help them make different decisions when they're faced with similar situations in the future. And then lastly, we have the concept of restoration, which includes supports and activities which help students and staff repair relationships, process events, and debrief incidents in those cases where students make choices that are not ideal. We know this framework to be symbolic of the ongoing interplay between prevention, logical consequences, and restoration within a building to help students and adults build and sustain positive and productive community. We recognize school climate is a reflection of the social emotional supports, and it is consistently available for all of our students. When we think about the first component, which is around prevention, we largely are talking about the multi-tiered systems of support, which you'll hear us refer to as MTSS, which is a framework that guides schools along a continuum of prevention and intervention services that support both students academically and behaviorally with varying intensities based on the needs of those students. The level of support provided is needs driven and can be implemented in three tiers that address the social and emotional as well as behavioral health needs of students to support a positive and sustainable school climate in which a space is created for staff, students, and families to feel socially, emotionally, and physically safe. This would include, but it's not limited to, the concept of supports around skill development, remediation, ensuring the coordination of services and other mental health supports, as well as a strong focus on prevention. 
So if we look at that tiered system of supports, it happens in three different tiers. The first is universal, and at universal supports, it targets the entire population. This would include a behavioral support that is positive and is linked to our social emotional learning programs. Such programs can be seen within Baltimore County Public Schools, but are not limited to school-wide community building, restorative practices, which is also aligned to our Maryland state regulations, positive behavioral supports, virtues language, and most recently, conscious discipline, which is in our pre-K through second grades. When we focus on tier two, these are our early interventions, which are supports offered for targeted populations based on more specificity of need. These supports and interventions can be carried out by implementing best practices along with the lines of classroom management, in which currently there are roughly 57 schools who are implementing that program. Classroom checkup, which is currently in 24 schools and being provided by over 80 staff members. And then the development of student support plans, which we know are plans that are provided for students based on the needs that they may have academically, behaviorally, for attendance and or health needs. There are other interventions that can be offered individually or in small group, which is also encompassed in our tier two interventions around cognitive behavior intervention, the concept of check-in, check-out, peaceful alternatives to tough situations, and zones of regulation. And then lastly, when we get to tier three, which is a more intensive intervention stage, this is where our most vulnerable populations who have additional needs and supports, this is where that is offered. And within these interventions and support, we serve a small subset of students who are demonstrating needs around potentially individualized educational planning, um, crisis intervention, beha applied behavioral analysis, or other supports that cater to students based on a small subset of needs that require additional supports and services from our school-based staff, as well as external partners. I will now uh, pass it over to Ms. Mustafer, who will share information regarding the other two components of the climate framework. Good afternoon. I'm gonna be speaking about logical consequences. Logical consequences as referenced by Dr. Brinkley Parker and as aligned to the school climate framework is a menu of reasonable reactions to students' behavior which holds students accountable for their choices. One of the um, documents that supports identifying reasonable or logical consequences is the student handbook. It is a document aligned to BCPS policy that supports students, parents, and staff in understanding of students' rights, responsibilities, and the code of conduct. The student handbook is the result of an annual collaborative effort by BCPS, central office staff, school administrators, teachers, and representatives from TABCO, the Teachers Association of Baltimore County. The student responsibilities and rights section of the student handbook are reflective of how we honor students' rights and responsibilities as they navigate throughout the school day. As aligned to COMAR, there are a list of interventions included that can be utilized with suspension and expulsion being the last resort. Annual professional learning is provided to school administrators to advise them on policy and practice and the student handbook is available online to all stakeholders. I will next transfer into discussions about restoration. You've had a presentation previously on restorative practices, but we wanna highlight how this aligns to our current behavioral policies. Restorative practices is based in principles that emphasize positive relationships as central to community building. Utilize this process to processes to prevent conflicts and establish pro-social relationships. Equally, restorative practices applies processes to repair the harm when conflicts arise through formal conferencing, impromptu conferences, circles, restorative questions, effective statements, and informal questioning. The inclusion of restoration is present in policy 5550 to be an intervention in practice as aligned. Restorative practices is used as a strategy that does not replace discipline. 
but it is a practice that restores the learning environment for many students, allows for accountability and repairing of harm through conversation amongst individuals. Current work targeting restoration, I want to share with you at this time. Um, it is a component of our framework as referenced earlier, included in policy 5550. It's in documents to support application and implementation. We've had professional learning that has continued to grow across Baltimore County. We've provided days one to four to 19 of our initiative schools, as well as opportunities for schools seeking this as aligned to their school progress plans. We've implemented a train the trainer model uh, within the Office of School Climate that consists of 20 trainers as of August 2018, who are trained in days one and two, that can now offer to train staff within Baltimore County on days one and two. We also have eight trainers uh, who are trained in days three and four, and they can provide training across our system in days three and four on restorative practices. At this time, we've trained 562 staff, and that is continuing to grow each day as we have a revolving training. Uh, collaborative partnerships that have been an outgrowth of this work are the Center for Dispute Resolution of University of Maryland, IIRP, the International Institute for Restorative Practices, and Hearts for Education. As we summarize and look and reflect on our school climate framework, it's very important for us to also take a look at how this aligns with our policy revisions. As you will see in front of you, the policies themselves are reflective of the framework of school uh, framework of school climate. As referenced by Dr. Brinkley Parker, as you review, review this chart, it can be observed that the policies being reviewed align within the framework and requirements of MSDE. As we review the policies through the lens of school climate, you will see that policies 5510 and 5550 contain elements from our positive behavior planning guide, connecting framework to school progress plans, expectations to ensure effective teaching, and connections with our health services. Logical consequences includes, and it includes information in 5460, which was renamed 5590, 5540, 5550, and 5560. Inclusive in that is your student handbook, the implementation of interventions, and the implementation of interventions. Restoration in 5550. That's inclusive of a continuum of restorative practices as referenced early in this presentation. I wanna be really, really clear that restoration of 5550 can serve in many different forms. Not, we have listed there that it is uh, formal conferencing. However, as aligned to the continuum to allow for all students to return to school, and also their classrooms and have a restorative learning environment. Dr. Martin Knox will move forward in the presentation to share the recommendations that are being proposed. So again, grounded in the work around the framework of the school climate, we'll begin with positive behavior as noted in policy <laughs> 5510. In 5510, there is a direct link to the school progress plan as principals plan with their teams each and every year. Not only are they taking into account the literacy aspect with an emphasis on reading and mathematics, but there's a component within the school progress plan where schools are expected to monitor the climates that our students learn in each and every day. Each climate and each classroom is expected to be student-centered with an emphasis on promoting safe academic instruction in an environment where all students are expected to grow and learn. Grounded in prevention and logical consequences and restoration with the clarification of definitions is also an adjustment that is made to policy 5510. And the positive guide or the positive behavior guide is currently under revision and also aligns very closely with policy 5510. And again, each and every decision that is made to meet the needs of students is just that. It's about children. Disruptive behavior. 
which is also being recommended for renaming to be called the Student Behavior Code. Within policy 5550, there's a shift from teaching and learning to effective teaching. And I apologize that this says learning, but it's effective teaching. In addition, there's the inclusivity of restorative language to reflect the interventions or the opportunity to prevent behaviors or intervene should the need arise. Policy 5560 also known as suspensions, assignment to alternative programs, or expulsions, is recommended for name, for, to be renamed for suspension, expulsion, or assignment to an alternative education program. There's change in the language, substituting business for calendar days to align with state regulations, as well as the addition of House Bill 425 for pre-K to second grade suspension changes. This information was again shared by the PJC group, and at the time, the information was included in policy, but as a result of the policy being placed on hold, this information has not been reflected, but as we are bringing that information forward to align with state regulations and COMAR. There's specificity regarding the PPW conferences, and the PPW is a pupil personnel worker who also serves as another layer of intervention and prevention. And policy 6602 is being recommended for deletion, and the information should be included in policy 5560. Alcoholic beverages, controlled dangerous substances, intoxicants, prescription and non-prescription drugs, also known as policy 5540. There's a recommendation to rename this policy, alcoholic beverages, controlled substances, inhalants and prescription and non-prescription drugs. This is again to align with the law, inclusive of the change in language from inhalant versus intoxicant, and the need for instruction as it relates to heroin and the opioid crisis that is facing our nation at this time. As Ms. Mustafer indicated earlier, there's also inclusion of language as it relates to the need to provide students with adequate health services and education. And finally, the annual parent communication is also being um, placed in the policy for the superintendent to communicate with parents regarding the use of um, such drugs within the schoolhouse. And finally, policy 5460, which also is um, considered searches. This is being recommended to be renumbered as policy 5590. And although law enforcement, if needed, has always been um, utilized in such severe cases, the language is now included in 5460. As we've stated earlier, there have been many opportunities for our stakeholders to provide input regarding our discipline policies. So to outline the next steps for the work as we continue to improve our practice, the Student Behavior and Discipline Council, which is the, student, uh, the Superintendent's Council, has another meeting scheduled to take place this month where we will gain input and insight from participants. At this time, we're also going through um, a review of the alternative education and assignment program to ensure its accuracy and support for our children, and the exploration of discipline practices in, as it relates to other LEAs within the state of Maryland. And I would also like to take an opportunity to look at the reflections. During the Student Discipline, Behavior and Discipline Council, there was feedback provided from the group as we had our meeting. And there were several components that were a takeaway for us as we listened intently to the information that was testing. 
First, the question was posed, do we need to spend more time on prevention? The voices of the teachers and the students and um, the staff that participated wanted us to really drill down to make sure that we were providing accurate and uh, appropriate interventions and prevention strategies, not just to our students, but for our staff, to make sure that professional development was meeting the needs of the varying student populations. There must be an approach that we keep equity at the forefront of all the decisions that are made, inclusive of the policies. There was a very powerful statement from one of the staff members as well, indicating consequences do not change the behavior of our children, which led to an intent focus on the prevention and intervention strategies that we're utilizing. And finally, the last takeaway was, are we talking to children who are having the most challenges and how are they showing up in our classrooms and our schools? This leads to the climate aspect. Are children invited and feeling welcomed when they come into our schools and when they enter into Baltimore County Public Schools? At this time, this concludes our presentation of the policies and we will yield at this time to you. Thank you so much for, for the presentation. You know, I'm reminded of, of the folks in our fire service. And um, we need folks with the training when there's a fire to run in to save lives and to save, you know, what property there may be, but to save lives when many folks are running, like, away from the fire. We need folks to be able to do that. But um, we also need folks to prevent fires. And that really is, in many ways, the future of uh, firefighting is to prevent the fire from ever, ever starting. So I'm very, very, I'm, I'm glad to hear about the idea of looking at this proactively to prevent what may, uh, what may arise in a school because of a variety of factors. Um, so that's, that's really good to hear. Um, our board members have been sitting very patiently uh, with regard to the presentation. Uh, my thinking was if uh, our colleagues, my colleagues have any questions with regard to the presentation just now, that this would be a good opportunity to ask those. And then uh, when we conclude with those questions with regard to the specific, with regard to the items in the presentation, we could then have a discussion about what's over the horizon uh, given uh, the context in which tonight's meeting is occurring. So uh, I would turn to our student member and ask if, based on the presentation, she may have any questions for our folks or anything to, to share. Thank you for the presentation. So I have a question. When you look at the whole prevention idea, is it an idea that's taking on a school's personal culture? Because it's one of those, you can't have a universal bullying, don't do this, don't do that. You can never have a universal school system-wide um, system that's saying don't act this way, don't do this. So when you look at prevention, is it more of an idea that's tailored to each school and each environment? Because zone one is different from zone two in a sense. So would it now be specific to the administration, specific to what the school believes? And then once the school um, sets that in place, is there a team that goes through what they have set in place to make sure that this is truly applicable for that school? Uh, thank you for your question. So to answer it, yes, um, each school is provided with the concept of prevention along those three tiers and the continuum within those tiers. And so they can either adopt programs that are specifically aligned to the um, target populations that they have along with the resources that are within the school. So each school is to have a team to help support the climate within the building. That would include your clinicians, your social workers, your psychologists, um, your school administration, nurses, um, teachers, and in some cases, depending on the external partnerships that they have with other um, health organizations, they may also be included. And then once that team meets to help create that structure, there's buy-in from the staff. And so staff members are helping to support for the universal program, such that you might see PBIS coming into play, or you'll see some schools that participate in other um, positive behavior systems in order to highlight the great things that are happening to help other students to buy into that. And certainly with the support of the executive directors and the community soups, they also help to um, look at that system 
in order to help them with structures. This year, we are fortunate enough to be able to have professional learning communities, which encompass that team, but it also includes a member from the school climate as well as the equity team in order to help to make sure that schools are aligning their resources appropriately. And if I may piggyback um, on what Dr. Brinkley Park has shared, it goes back also for the individual needs because every school is different regardless as to the zone in which they are housed. When schools develop, back to the point I made earlier, when they develop their school progress plans, they place an emphasis on the needs that they've noted within the schoolhouse, be it through qualitative or quantitative analysis of data. The school progress plan focused on the climate section really gets to the meat of what the school needs, and the schoolhouse leaders um, actually develop that plan. Thank you, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. First of all, in the last session of the legislature, there were numerous bills passed relative to bullying. Are all these contained within our, our new policies? Well, let me back up. You know, we hear we hear a lot from parents about bullying, and and I always get the feeling that that the parents don't understand that we understand what they're talking about, mm -hmm. and we understand the reality of it. In fact, the reality of it reaches all the way to the Congress. So I'm just wondering, as we review these bills that are go through the legislature, and I know there were a couple of them last year, I'm just wondering how we adapt to what they're passing, and then is that included in all this? So. To be completely transparent, you threw me off when you said all, because I don't want to say yes to all, well, but I can say that the regulations that are established and guided by COMAR, they are inclusive in the policies. Um, so we have a harassment and intimidation and bullying reporting uh, approach that we utilize to make sure we're addressing the needs as they are presented to us. Um, that can be presented electronically, but it is also um, within the student handbook. So to answer your question, yes, we do align our policies with whatever those regulations may be specifically to bullying. Right. The other um, question is really more specific to policy 5540, and only because of the fact that uh, the legislature uh, has uh, passed uh, relative to medical marijuana. And I don't see it mentioned anywhere in the policy or even referenced other than controlled substance and so forth and so on, but yet there, the health. I mean, there's got a lot to be done around that, and I'm wondering when we, if we have kids who have valid uh, credentials for the use of medical marijuana, uh, what, are, how are we going to work it? I haven't seen anything here that even addresses it, so I'm just wondering: are, are we working on that? Uh, do we recognize that it could be a potential problem? Et cetera. That's a great question, and to answer it, yes. Um, we do know that we will have students and have students who have medicinal use utilization of medical marijuana. So um, when we look at 5540, that's why there's a description of prescription and non-prescription, because if it's prescribed and it's being utilized for something other than what it was prescribed for, then it can be addressed under 5540. But in most cases, uh, with any prescribed uh, drug, it must be administered by the school nurse with the appropriate documentation from their pediatrician or physician. Okay. I was. I was just trying to, to uh, well, um, a, lot, a lot of the use is not within the day, but perhaps in the evening, and I'm just visualizing some kids coming to school not functioning as they normally would because of the use, and, and it's a legal and proper use, and just wondering how, we, how our staff will be able to identify that use or that, that child and appropriately deal with it, um, not necessarily during the day, but coming to school. So it would still be in the students' records. Um, it should be. So we would ask our parents, as with any prescription drug, um, it, it could occur now if a student has a cold or the flu or something and they come to school with some, a substance in their system um, that causes uh, dizziness, shall I say, um, the parent would have the appropriate documentation to show to the school administration and the nurse um, to make sure that child was okay. Do you think we ought to be more explicit in, in, in actually identifying of medical marijuana, other than we're saying that it is under controlled substance or that it's a, a prescribed prescription? 
Yeah, I'm, that's my, my feeling is that I don't think we're paying enough attention to it directly because I think it's getting so, widespread use. Excuse me, Mr. Yolfelder. Um, I believe that the Office of School Health Services is working on procedures because there are issues related to licensure for our school nurses. And so School Health Services is working on the interplay between medical marijuana and the ability of school nurses to dispense or more appropriately the inability of school nurses to dispense. David, do you have any other questions? Um, in the notebook that you have, um, the binder was uh, compiled and includes a very recent uh, tab, which is tab 22 with regard to school discipline. It is, um, it's dated September 25th, 2018. And that's tab 22, uh, September 25th, 2018, and that's from MSDE. So in an effort to get board members some of the most current, most recent um, Maryland State uh, uh, Department of Education documents, um, this document has, takes a look backward and a look forward. And that's why um, members, uh, current members and future members, that may be a very, very useful document going forward with regard to the policies. But because you had specifically asked about uh, actions at the state level, I thought I should share that, that, that to you. And of course, you'll want time to uh, read that and absorb it as well. Um, Kathleen, do you have any questions based on the presentation? Um, because afterwards, we will talk about uh, next steps specifically for uh, our own committee. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for that presentation. It was very helpful. Um, and I appreciate having the handout so that we could follow along. Um, the first question I have, is this going, is that presentation going to be available on, uh, connected to the minutes for this meeting or connected to the agenda for this meeting that are on the website? Uh, the answer is yes. Okay. And in fact, it's now been incorporated as part of the um, video mm -hmm. of the live stream for the meeting. Okay, so the great. answer is of course. Okay, wonderful. And. Um, the other question I had is to follow up with Matt, Ms. Adekoya in discussing the differences in schools, especially along grade ranges, um, but also just depending, we have special schools and we have alternative schools. Um, and the issues around school climate may be different in each of those situations. How do we make sure and how do the policies reflect that the um, that there is consistency in the application of the policies and the procedures um, to ensure that no matter where a student is or where a teacher may transfer, that there's consistent uh, classroom climate, whether it's behaviors of the students or whether it's the school-wide progress plan. What, what, um, at what level is that looked at and how is that managed? So we have a framework for the climate within the school progress plan. We also have the policies that govern how we respond. However, one of the regulations gives the flexibility to principals to administer uh, discipline as appropriate for that individual situation for that child. So we have the consistency in terms of the framework, but given the student, given the situation, and given the leadership and having the background information, because every child in every situation has a varying story, just as long as it's within the framework of the policies and the student handbook, there is some flexibility for principals um, to address situations as they deem appropriate. So how, how is that monitored in terms of schools meeting their school progress plan? Do they set specific goals in terms of student behavior or uh, if logical consequences are applied? in meeting some goals around those. So how is it monitored, the school progress plan being achieved, but also any um, discretion that the principals do have? So there are quarterly monitoring reports for the school progress plans that are submitted to the executive director and the community superintendent. And they review that data um, with the principals, with the administrative team, and with the school progress planning teams as well, because it's a collective effort. 
and that information is looked at to determine if the goals that have been established are being met. Um, they take into consideration student attendance, uh, student discipline data, um, student academic performance, um, and those are just three of the big rocks that they look at to determine if they're moving toward meeting the goals that they've established at the, be at the beginning of the school year. Okay, that's very helpful. And is there a report that's given to the board that aggregates that together in order to share with us the success that the schools are having in meeting their school progress plans? No, ma'am, not to my knowledge. Okay, well that might be helpful. So that's something that we, this committee can consider and the, and the wider board can consider. Um, are we, Mr. Birch, are we gonna go through each of the policies as we typically do? Because I have questions around each policy, but I didn't wanna bring those in if we're gonna go through each one. There are essentially two main policies that drive much of the remainder of our policies, and because of the amount of them, uh, prioritization, I think, is warranted. And if you note the, the careful articulation by, in the presentation really does reference these two, 5550 and 5560. So um, going forward uh, this evening, the plan is, after we've had an opportunity to ask um, questions related to the presentation, we then as a committee can decide um, how we uh, wish to proceed because one of the interests of the members were to have an update as to the work of the council and where they have been. And um, I see this presentation providing uh, a snapshot, although we, one could say there's several snapshots, uh, providing a snapshot for where the uh, system has been with regard to these two main policies and related ones. So if you have some questions that relate to the um, general comments um, uh, referenced uh, by Dr. Martin Knox, I think this is the time to ask them, because when that is done, we can then discuss as a, uh, as a committee how we want to proceed, because uh, I made uh, my own notes with regard to the um, proposed revised policies that were in our own packet, the blue sheets, and I have several sheets, several pages of questions that I have about that specific language. But if one takes a look at what's in our uh, binder, the most updated uh, binder with regard to discipline matters, there's some additional things that I think reasonable committee policymakers might want to review um, to buttress, uh, strengthen, update their own understanding about behavior issues. That's why we would discuss it. Now, I think that kind of uh, reiterates what I had mentioned earlier, but I can understand how that may have been a little, that may not have been uh, precise enough going forward. So if you have some questions related to what has been shown to you in these uh, snapshots, uh, now would be a good time to ask that. Okay, thank you. So going back to um, the presentation, when you, outlined the Student Behavior and Discipline Council. Could you just review who is on that council and how often it's met? So the council itself met one time this year so far, and we are meeting four more times this school year. Uh, members on that council include a student member, um, parent, input, I mean parent participants, uh, and various staff members, including principals um, from each grade level, from elementary, middle, and high school, and several other staff members as well. TABCO. And representatives from TABCO. So that is the same council that has TABCO members on it? It does have TABCO members. Okay, and are there, is there another group that I thought was meeting more in the, within the past 12 months. So there was, do you wanna take that, Dr. McComas? Yes, so uh, yes. So there was the TABCO um, work group. You, they affectionately refer to themselves as dogs, if you remember TABCO sitting there. Um, we met with uh, the TABCO uh, discipline work group approximately four or five times in the spring semester. It was about every month, um, but sometimes with the holidays in there, it may have shifted around. Okay, and how and how was that work aggregated or grouped? Because I see a couple quotes from the end that you talked about the Student Behavior and Discipline Council, but nothing specific as to that group's work. Yes. Or is that it, or is that in the binder? 
I'm not sure if it's in the binder, but I'll speak to it. Um, and I know Ms. Mustafer may uh, jump in as well. So that group, we really spent time talking about implementation, right, of our current uh, policies. And we spent time talking about um, positive behavior, and it really led to us looking at our positive behavior handbook, and again, I know Ms. Mustafer was involved in that process, as well as their involvement with our student handbook annual um, committee uh, review and process there. Um, and, and that's really kind of where that work went last year with those two groups. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And then just more generally, we typically have a uh, policy analysis statement that goes along with each revised policy that's shared with us. So it seems that this would be the policy analysis for the whole group. Is that a fair statement? Or will there be in the future, uh, Mr. Virch, individual policy analysis coming for each proposed revised policy? Two things. First, there's the near, f the near future, and then there's the less near future. The less near future is what the next board and the next PRC committee decides to do. In the near future, meaning tonight, well, this is about the review that the board had asked be commenced. The review actually commenced a month earlier, and it commenced a month early with input from uh, folks from the Justice Center and from uh, uh, Disability Maryland who came and spoke with us, and uh, Dr. Martin Ox, in fact, referenced um, uh, and, and, and her pre presenters with her referenced some of those suggestions. So that review actually began a month earlier, and part of the review now has provided us with these binders and the updated S, uh, MSDE information. And given the limited amount of time that the Policy Review Committee has, uh, that's why we're now going to have a discussion afterwards. But in terms of the policy analysis, that really that wasn't a sensical thing to to have given that this is all in a context of a general review and then the committee has to be able to say how it wants to proceed in the next near term future for the committee because there's only one more month left for um, for some of the board members Our student member will still be here uh, we know that uh, however the student member may not be a member of the policy review committee I think that would be a bad idea but that'll be decided by the next board. So that's what's uh, going on with regard to the policy analysis. Thank you. And then also um, when you're discussing about um, providing more information on our, our alternative schools and programs, what, um, what information do you see coming to the board or coming to PRC in what time frame? So um, the um, information that's resulting from a five-year study is looking at our current alternative programs and it's considering how we administer um, from discipline to assignments to actually how we restore a student returning to the learning environment um, i i know that it is um, definitely under review and consideration for what information we will be receiving um, but it is a five-year uh, plan and so at the of course at the end of that we will receive a summary as far as recommendations they are just starting that and they're in the initial phases of looking at schools interviewing school personnel um, having conversations with students um, that will reveal and hopefully give them ideas on what recommendations they can bring forward to our system for consideration so when you say they're just starting that now and it's a five-year plan they're reviewing the last five years in order to come up with a five-year plan moving forward? No, they've established um, as a result of that uh, contract and partnership, they have started that process and that was started this school year to move things forward for the next five years. And which contract is that? Um, that is with um, Clemson University Dropout Prevention. Yes. Okay, great. And then um, who is managing that project? Um, so I 
believe, um, and I've served with uh, many of these individuals, it's been a collaborative process as we navigated into the Division of School Climate and Safety. Um, many of us came out from academic services, and this actual conversation was started in that office and now is transitioning over to the Division of School Climate and Safety. Okay, so ultimately it's, a, it's uh, under Dr. Penelope Martin Knox. Sorry, I thought that was all. That would be correct. Okay, great. Um, okay, and then uh, will we see then trends in our alternative schools and programs in terms of how many students we're serving, the ratio of staff, the supports that have been provided in the past, and what those outcomes were for the students? So that's some of the information that we hope to glean from this study. Um, have we been effective in our approaches and how we can better serve our children? So that hopefully the, the questions you've posed will be a result of the interviews that are being held and the research that is conducted um, for Baltimore County Public Schools. Okay, because some of the concerns that I've heard is that we don't have enough uh, options for alternative placements that perhaps we need to do more for the students that are in those programs in order to um, restore them, as we might be saying now, um, so that they could come back to their home school or have a positive outcome finishing up at the, with our alternative program. So we certainly want to understand what's happened in the past, what's been successful, and where we might improve going forward. Um, the other thing is, and I don't, again, I don't know if it's in the binder since we just received those, but is there um, student suspension data in here in terms of the look back in order for us to plan and move forward? I do not believe no. it's included, no ma'am. Okay, um, I think that's something that would be helpful, um, especially when we are talking about uh, different populations and what is happening within them. So are we making improvements for some of our special populations where we feel like we haven't in the past? Um, so I think it would be helpful to bring forward um, to the board or policy review to begin with um, that disaggregated data. I was able to uh, look up on Maryland State Department of Education and they have um, a report, it was 55 pages, but I only printed one page, uh, one table where it shows the out of school suspensions and expulsions as one number, uh, which I don't think is as helpful as separating out because that's obviously a very different outcome for our student if we have um, an out of school suspension for maybe just a few days as opposed to an expulsion. Um, so it would be helpful to have that. But so it's a 15 year table and report and it shows the, the trends. But again, that, that would be something that would be helpful with those things separated and and then across our populations. Because it's always good to see where we've been and then be able to perhaps even set specific goals and then see how we're doing with the new plans that we're making. Um, and then also for suspensions to be distinct in whether it's an in-school suspension or an out-of-school suspension. Because if we can have children with in-school suspensions where they're still receiving education, then obviously that's a better option for the student to be able to keep up in their, in their academics. So that would be, we would need to look at that differently to see how that is being um, uh, provided for the students and then again what the outcomes are. And then uh, in terms of working on this on related issues, um, how are we working on all of these issues related to our equity policy and, and how we're trying to achieve equity for our students? Um, so as stated before, in order to make sure that we are using equity as an interwoven part of all of the decision making, we have coupled with the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency in order to go into schools to conduct um, observation of school-based practices in order to make recommendation for leadership teams around making sure that we are inclusive of all of our student populations. Okay, and is there data that you're looking at related to that, whether it's certain populations, free and reduced meals, or other things in terms of making sure we're serving students that may need extra supports? So we're looking at all of that data. Um, the school and with the 
collaboration of the executive director and community soup is helping to use that data to inform what we would consider the problem of practice in order to come up with trends to understand how we can address each school who may be having an equity um, conversation in order to address each population. So it will vary based on what the school's um, problem of practice is as identified in their data. Okay, and is there anything in here related to that in our binder? No. No. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, and um, I'll just um, finish up with that and then move along with individual questions I have with each policies. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention that I believe this whole framework Here, let me for recognize our student oh, members. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, feel the free. Frame Thank you so much. <laughs> the framework for climate, the logical consequences, the restoration, and the prevention, it is an amazing framework, and I believe it's one step closer to looking at a child as an individual and as a more holistic being. You now take into consideration that, okay, a teacher might say I have 32 students. No, you have 32 individual students who come from different backgrounds, who might have a parent that, parents that are arguing at home, so that might affect how they're acting in school, who might not have any friends in classrooms, so they feel secluded and alone. So I just believe that the practices and the, the um, climate, the framework for climate, it really takes into consideration what we are always saying about mental health, mental health, mental health, but not just mental health, you're taking all other aspects of what makes me, me, into consideration to determine how you're going to treat my situation and I really enjoy and I appreciate how it's a person to person basis because I'm different from the person I sit next to in class and that's not to say they cannot be held accountable for what they did wrong but it's to say that certain things that they're going through will play a factor and will have an effect on how they interact and how they perform so yes thank you so much um, I did want to ask you a few questions, if I could, with regard to the presentation and some of the responses to what I thought were really some excellent questions from our um, our committee members on the the idea of adopting programs per uh, as needed per each school's school team. Um, is there a uh, uh, some immediate programs that come to mind that um, might be in the basket for adoption by a school team? So when you look at the multi-tiered system of support and you're considering what the needs of the school are, you're certainly looking at the variated levels, uh, uh, tiers, if you will, um, to consider what the needs are. And yes, we this year we did receive 10 um, resource teachers, and they have now been cross-trained. And why I say this to you is because they are the experts in these areas. They've been cross-trained in a wealth of academic as teachers, but they're also trained in a wealth of, of um, curricula and information on social-emotional learning. So they, in their toolkit, work directly with schools as aligned to their uh, school progress plans, and they can offer to schools and say, these are opportunities that are available, this is information, these are um, strategies and interventions, from a universal to a tier three, which is an intensive level of intervention. Um, also, um, on BCPS1, there's also our MTSS tile that's on there, and in that, you can go through that tile and look at various interventions from grades to um, developmental levels to ages to needs. Uh, we talked a little bit about bullying. All of that information is encompassed in there, and schools can go through and look at what their school's needs are and align the um, support that they need for their individual school and students as well. Very briefly, and you've discussed this, it's been discussed previously uh, in, in board meetings, but could you just uh, give us a sort of a thumbnail about the, the circles that you had mentioned? The restorative circles. Yes. Okay, a thumbnail. Um, Two thumbnails. Two thumbnails, okay. Um, the circles that we've done, there's a range. Um, you could do a classroom circle, which is for instructional purposes. 
um, but always for the purpose of building community. So in those circles, there's opportunities for learning, but there's also opportunities, for example, um, we've worked with schools where students come in first thing in the morning and they do what's called circle up. And in that circle, they are having a conversation could be on various topics. Um, usually teachers ask a specific question, the students will give a response, and it's a great opportunity for our teachers to learn about our students, but also for our students to learn about our teachers. And through that process, it builds that relationship and allows for, if you're having a tough day, that's a safe space to bring that information to. If you're challenged by something that's coming up later in the day and you're anxious, you can bring that to that community. If there was a problem the day before, that could be an opportunity to bring that up and have a discussion about what the concerns are. So when you're talking about circles, there's always instructional opportunities, but that can also be leveraged with how we build community, community through that sense of relationship and belonging in the schoolhouse. Thank you. I do want to ask you about behavior and the sense that behavior can be viewed as incident specific. So someone, uh, one of our students, um, acts out and uh, perhaps strikes another student, there's that incident. But behavior can also be viewed as part of a continuum. And things may start low and build, they may start high, and one would hope that that, that, that may be the end of that, that they actually improve. Um, but this, this notion of the continuum, how, how do how do the the idea of pre, how does the idea of prevention on the continuum work? Is that the goal is then once there's some indication of behavior, if you will, of a behavior improvement need, so there's the identification, and then we turn to because we've now been trained, we now turn to our multi-tier approach, determine the nature of the need, then. Having been trained, we look to what may be in our, our, our medicine bag to reach in to design some effort going forward that is individualized for this student, or in the alternative, a, a collaboration with the teacher because the teacher may be a new teacher. If you can, could you talk a bit about that? So it's sort of exactly what you just said. Um, the primary focus of a tiered support is to recognize that a large majority of the population is going to fall into the needs of that universal support, which means if we as a community focus on what we view to be the behaviors that we desire to see in students, and we um, acknowledge those behaviors and re reward students for them, that there will be a subset of students who come with varying needs based on either their community, um, things that have happened within previous schooling locations or things that just kind of show up based on the nature of um, outside factors that may or may not be within our control. And so it is important to understand along the continuum as we move up into the tiered approach, staff members are trained based on additional supports that can be gathered. And so we begin to create plans that are specific to targeted groups, whether that be around your attendance concerns or your behavioral concerns or an academic approach. And from that, we create an individualized plan for that student that would address a series of interventions that are offered on a rotating basis. And then you assess those interventions to see if the student is meeting success with them. And when they don't meet with success and you feel the need to ramp up additional supports, then you get into the more intensified stage in which we begin to add additional supports that may be gleaned through um, resources that can be through your um, a student receiving an IEP or a student getting hooked with wraparound services that may be through an external partner. So the idea is that all students are then receiving supports that are based on the needs and how they show up so that we can begin to baseline that support for them so that they meet with success academically and behaviorally. As I move through the 6th District and I go to other schools and I talk with staff, I talk with teachers, there's, there's the concept of the individual child and then the individual child in the classroom and all of the other students. And when a child with, to use the term, behavioral needs to be serviced, to be addressed, to be uh, improved upon, the effect upon the other students who, 
their behavior, their behavior continuum is not the same. Um, but the time that then is devoted f to the child that has these other behavior needs, that is impacting on the instruction time, the attention time of the teacher. And with some student populations, you know, the focus, it's, a, it's something that, that you're nurturing, and I'm not a teacher, but you're nurturing every minute in the classroom because you have the child for this period of time, which then means how do we view the education needs balanced with the behavioral needs that some of our students present with? How do we balance that? And there are those who say it's an easy balance. It's like a light switch on a wall. There's two options. Either you're in the classroom or you're out of the classroom. And out of the classroom may also mean out of the school. And out of the school may also mean out of the system. What I like about what I hear today is the nuance, recognizing individuality of the students, but there is always that issue because as a parent, uh, uh, as a parent would say to me, you know, my kid is doing everything right, but he is receiving less because of the attention that needs to be directed to a student in the classroom. Can't they just take this student with these behavioral needs and it's not described that way, with these behavioral needs out of that classroom, things would be so much better. And then, you know, the focus is then on the other students. And while it may not be 32 in the classroom, um, perhaps 22 to 24, 26, that there would then be this net improvement in the classroom climate and benefit the school climate. That is the, that is the you know, that is a far less nuanced view of what occurs in a classroom. Um, my own view is that we can't be in the business of throwing kids away, notwithstanding how we have to balance those educational needs of all of our students. Can you just briefly, Dr. Martin Knox, can you just briefly explain what you share with parents that come to you with that light switch view of what occurs in a classroom? Well, first and foremost, we want environments where all of our children are able to learn and access the instruction. Um, when I hear concerns such as that, the first thing I tell the parent is that we will look into the matter and work collectively with the principal, do an observation, and it may be providing the teacher with professional development and additional supports to meet the child's needs. It could also be the flip side with making sure we get underneath whatever the concerns are for the, or the issues are with that other child. Um, as was so eloquently stated again by our student member of the board depends on what that child comes to school with that day. So is there a specific answer for that child? Not at all times, because it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So it's twofold. It's helping the teacher um, identify interventions, and it's also trying to determine what needs the child has to be met. Um, Ms. Mustaford just explained earlier about the restorative circles. If you've not seen one, this would be a great opportunity for you to go observe one, because oftentimes a child will come to school and tell you what it is that's bothering them and will communicate that I'm going to have a bad day today. And so how do we get in front of that to help that child? child. On the opposite end, you have some children who really can't explain what it is that is causing them to act out. Um, but it truly is about collectively wrapping around and supporting the teacher, but also supporting the child. So definitely looking into the matter to determine what I can do to provide support, working collectively with the executive director and the community superintendent um, to see if it's a class wide situation that's occurring throughout the day, which would mean probably there's support that's needed for the teacher or if it's that one individual child. Um, accessing those resources, whether it's through the school counselor, the school social worker, the school's PPW, the school psychologist, there are a lot of resources that we can access to help our children um, because as you said, we don't want to throw them away. Um, so ultimately, it's determining the root cause that's driving these behaviors. Sometimes it's also fearful avoidance. Um, where there's an academic 
gap where the child does not understand the content and the behavior is used as a deterrent to avoid showing that he or she does not know. So it's really getting to the root cause of why the child is acting the way he or she is acting. Um, but in addition to while we're trying to determine what those issues are, providing support to the teacher to help them continue to educate the others who may be observing or being having their, inter their instruction interrupted by these behaviors. So identifying the signaling of a student, potential signaling of a student with behavior, cons behavior needs, then can prevent what might otherwise be a loss of instructional time and a loss of benefits <coughs> to the other students that didn't bring that behavioral need. So then we're then benefiting not just the student with the behavioral need, we're able to deliver the instructional time to the students who don't have that specific behavioral need. Got it. Easier than calling the fire truck to come to the fire, it's easier if you can prevent the fire. I got you. All right. Um, and, and may I? Yes, add, no, please, please, please. It goes back to the relationships piece. Um, when we talk about the restorative, when we talk about conscious discipline, um, teaching t children about their self awareness um, and really helping them with their executive functions, um, it really helps to get in front of it with that relationship and really understanding the needs of a child. And it's truly a partnership, the teacher's partnership with the parent, the teacher's partnership with the child, so that collectively we can continue to develop the child, um, which is what we signed up to do as educators. And collectively continue to instruct the other students that on this particular day may not be signaling or presenting with a behavioral need. Because someone, because another parent's child may one day come to school with that behavioral need and we can't be about the business of just throwing away our kids. Okay, I got you. Um, any other questions from, uh, from our committee members? All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, at this point, I said that after we uh, had uh, questions about the, uh, the general presentation that was made to us, it would be an opportunity for our committee members to discuss about going forward in the near term as to uh, what uh, would be a good way to approach this matter of the review of discipline. David, you had some um, uh, questions uh, or some thoughts about that. What are your suggestions? We have an enormous amount of material here. Um, you referred to the two policies that seem to be the uh, primary policies and the other policies seem to be emanating from those in one, one form or another. So I'm just wondering if, if we, we shouldn't break this down into some, in, into well, we're not going to get it all accomplished this evening, and I'm wondering if we, <coughs> we should set a time, um, perhaps, uh, discuss uh, a certain portion now and then recess and have another meeting instead of adjourning. Um, I, I looked at, so other than the two major policies, I was wondering if we could start backwards maybe and, and review those policies um, because they seem to be, um, uh, most, most of them seem to be uh, in coordination with MSDE and uh, other uh, laws and principles and things that we have to follow and then perhaps get into the two major policies uh, at another time, but specifically for those two policies. David, if I may ask you, would you want the opportunity to review, say, the MSD uh, September 25th, 2018 document about school discipline uh, before you um, engaged in questioning about our, our discipline behavior uh, policies. It's totally important. I mean, I, you know, we're just looking at it. referenced it or somebody referenced it. Um, and, and, you know, really just looking at it very quickly, you know, I see where it's applicable to a lot of things we've been discussing and probably is the most current um, reflection of MSDE. Um, I, I would believe that that's, that that should be done first, and perhaps uh, mm -hmm. then. You know, Let me ask you: Would you, if I if I may, would you also be interested in suspension, current suspension, and expulsion data across specific or certain student groups? Well, I think we have quarterly and annual uh, suspension data. I've seen it per school broken broken mm -hmm. down in a number of different ways. Um, 
I don't know whether it extends to alternative education. I'm not quite sure that if it does. I'm usually focusing on just some specific <coughs> schools, but we, we have that available to us every quarter and annually, at least for the last school year. And I don't know how many of us or how many of the board has taken the opportunity to review it, but there's a wealth of information in there. And, and also it's an opportunity to, to, to view in terms of progress that may have been made by looking at numbers and percentages from the past school year, uh, which is also important. Um, if I may just ask you on that point, would you, have, would, you, would you welcome the opportunity to review that information? I'd love to have it available as we discuss things because, you know, uh, you know realistically, you know, um, where we, we should be concerned about every child. We're dealing in an environment, and our environment today, and I mean our national environment, is, is really being influenced by changing of culture. And, and culture is, sta is starting at the highest level in, 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 in term and politically, and, and it's really influencing. And social media is now having a huge, huge effect. Um, the uh, erroneous dissemination of information, false information that's out there, um, a lot of that is just influencing uh, not only us, but our children as well, who are probably use the, the social media much more than we do. Um, so I, I think we're, I think you know I feel like I'm I'm, I'm a uh, probably a, a salmon trying to get upstream. We're always going to be fighting this issue, and so I think we, we've got to deal with this with a lot of flexibility, <coughs> recognizing that um, as much as we say culture shifts take time, I think they're they're moving much rap much more rapidly than in the past, and I think we just have to address all the, all the the cultural changes that are coming on very quickly. Um, you know, we, we have, I and mean, I look at it, to address each child, you probably need much greater resources than we have now. And, and you know, I, I got a number of kids myself, so I'm trying to think. Disruptive behavior, if you take the population of children involved, who, who, who create disrupt, uh, disrupt, disruptive behavior, behavior there are probably a dozen or so influencing factors that are maybe pretty common within this framework of, of kids who, who create uh, the, the problems. And, and I don't know that we're, we have the resources uh, because generally they're beyond our control. Uh, our kids are coming to school influenced by things that we cannot control. And, and I, I, I sometimes I get irritated at the parents who seem to want to uh, place the fault on the school system where I always thought we were here to teach kids and not to raise the kids. Um, if I may just interrupt you briefly there. That's would my, then, that's my uh, no, well, well, well we, we do have other members who may, may wish to do that, but um, if- Soapbox with anybody else. Uh, certainly. Um, my question is would, if- a, I think we gotta find a format for, for we gotta discuss yeah. how we go about taking all this information and, and realistically make, making, you know, applying it and, and perhaps um, looking at making policies that, uh, that at least for, for the immediate future will seem to be correct policies. And then probably a year from now, we're gonna decide that they have to be uh, adjusted again well, I might just go to that information piece. Information about our alternative schools is information. Do you think that that would assist you in the questioning that you might have with regard to the alternative school policy that's included in our package? Absolutely. I, I think mm -hmm. any data that there's available relative to the various policies is very helpful. And current expulsion and suspension over certain student groups which is already available, That's already but available. in a more handy version yeah, that you can put it. your hands right on it so that it informs your questioning. That is that sort of where you're because going? Because there's certain policies that would be more applicable to, to, to some data and, and other policies to other data, and I don't know if we have it here or not. Kathleen had made reference to school progress plans. Kathleen, do you feel that some school progress plans, uh, some analysis of that would help inform your your questioning or uh, help assist answering questions you may have about about behavior in our schools. 
Thank you, Mr. Virch. I think it would, and I think perhaps um, rather than just a lot of data, but maybe one or two case studies on a school named or unnamed about development of their school progress plan, their goals, and the achievement over the last year of, of their goals in terms of what strategies they were using, um, something along those lines. So we can see in a real soup to nuts fashion how these policies and the procedures actually guide what's happening in the schoolhouse. I think something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, since we're just and it was the opportunity for members to exchange and talk about how we do these next steps, then there's certain information that, some of which is already available. We just want it in a more readily available means for us to have our hands on to inform our questions and decision making about behavior policies. That's the sense that I have from the members. Halima, if there's something else you wanted to add, please let me know. Is this a matter of how to break this down? It's a matter of how to break this Microphone down. on, buddy. Oh, there you go. It's on. I'm sorry. This is a matter of how to break this down and how to work around it. We can always um, do least to greatest and start from least and go to greatest. Uh, but I think there's what I'm hearing is that there's there's the issue of, of being, being informed in one's questioning and rather than beginning half-hearted, uh, however sincerely, that the value of the additional information then would better inform the information would the better inform the questioning and decision making with regard to additional policies. So there's the issue of school progress plans, what if any information may be available there. There's the information about the alternative, alternative schools. Thirdly, there's the information about expulsions and suspensions, information that's already been presented to the board. Um, Kathleen, you had a number of, of questions that you asked about the consistent application and asked if there was anyone looking at the consistent application of that data. Um, are there any other types of information that you think would be most helpful to inform your questioning and or decision making beyond those already identified tonight? Well, one of the issues when we're talking about every child that comes to us, that we want to provide the best learning opportunities for every child that comes to us, that we need as Ms. Adekoya said, to look at each child as we've talked about personalizing instruction and knowing each child's story. Um, we also, in conversations that I've had with school psychologists, uh, our guidance counselors and so forth, it seems that there are increasing levels of anxiety or other mental health issues uh, that's happening with our children. Um, in fact, the state legislature recently <clears throat> a year or so ago required that we include three hours of curriculum around mental health awareness, um, which I think is fantastic. And I'm very excited how um, Ms. Lewis in the Office of School Safety and um, has employed um, Dr. Schwartz from Johns Hopkins in helping us to develop that. That's been um, very amazing. The other thing that I have spent time um, understanding through our Special Education Citizens Advisory Council and also our Gifted and Talented Citizens Advisory Council is that sometimes misbehaviors or disruptions in the classroom are because of, as you mentioned, academic challenges, whether that's a struggling reader who is in some way masking a frustration or expressing a frustration at not being able to keep up with their peers or to enjoy learning because it's a struggle to read, but also if it's a board student, a student that has already mastered the content being presented and then can get into a little bit of mischief if they are not engaged in instruction. Um, so I'm wondering in terms of, I know we have a pilot about um, doing universal screening um, around reading, so maybe understanding how that's going, um, because if, as been talked about, by Steve and David and uh, Ms. Adekoya is understanding how the children are coming to us so that we can make sure we are trying to provide the best resources. And as David pointed out, we don't have unlimited resources, but in order to properly utilize the resources that we do have. Um, so I'm wondering if there's information that would be relevant to bring to the board in terms of our struggling readers, in terms of diagnosing, and supporting their, their reading ability, 
um, identification of the gifted and talented populations, and also it, it, are there noticeable increases in IEPs or 504s, um, whether it's uh, because we have more diagnosed special needs or more diagnosed medical mental health issues? Is that information that would be helpful? Because if we, if we understand for whatever reason, culturally or medically, things are happening in our, and these are nationwide issues, these are statewide issues. Um, but again, it's about identifying the children, what the needs are, and how we can provide supports. Um, so is that something that would be helpful? Because if we're having increased behavior incidents, but we are using tools to recognize them and then support them, that's going to prevent disruption in the future. So is, is there information that you think could be provided along those lines? Do you have trends? Hi. Um, and, and I think, go ahead. And if it's something you need to look into and get back to us, but that's one of the things where I've heard a lot from different parents mm -hmm. um, and, and our staff. Right. Well, first I'd say, uh, you know, absolutely understanding the function of a behavior, why a child is exhibiting that behavior is really the, the core of what any intervention is about and our framework for climate excuse me is really about supporting schools in their um, direct service to children to kind of walk through that and figure out why is a student behaving the way they are i have seen students over the last two decades um, exhibit disruptive behavior because they had an academic deficiency and that disruptive behavior they were counting on getting thrown out of class. I've seen students as an administrator um, go way out of their way to seek a suspension. Um, that They had a truancy problem, then when they were in school they were trying acting out to try to be suspended because again that would have ultimately been a negative reinforcement and not an actual punishment. So I just use those as some examples to um, support what you're saying around it, how critical it is to understand the function of behaviors um, because human behavior is complex um, and it's very easy to make an, a, a decision based on emotions as opposed to a, an analysis of behavioral functions. Uh, you asked for uh, many pieces of information, um, many of which are not unnecessarily accessible in like an easy to reach out and gather data format for you. Um, and so I think that's where you're seeing me ponder is I understand you're seeking to have a, a more full picture um, but many of these things aren't something I can just click a button and say run a report. Um, because again, much of that work is really conducted at the school level on individual cases, and that's part of our building out and making sure that schools have high functioning, multi tiered systems of support uh, that do that behavior analysis. So I just share that with you that um, some of the things you asked for. Are things that are accessible. I know Mr. Yulfelder brought up suspension uh, reports that are routine and quarterly, um, some of which are not as easily accessible in a report format. I would just, uh, if I could just um, intervene here very briefly, and I see that we have our presenters who'd like to make a, make a point, but I thought Kathleen had a really good idea about case studies, and I'm reminded of our sixth district two uh, schools that service our 6th district. The first is an elementary school. It is uh, McCormick Elementary School. Uh, the principal's name sadly escapes me, but um, this is a, a principal that I had a really very, very, very good conversation with. And they have an, an information room that is f that gathers data about their school progress plan. Again, I'm, I apologize to the principal and her staff because she's really, a, uh, I really like the principal. Um, but uh, I spent a fair amount of time inside this sort of information room uh, where uh, folks gather data about progress on the school progress plan. That's the first thing that occurred to me. The second thing that occurred to me is um, the principal of our um, uh, Pine Grove Middle School. And uh, when you go into the principal's office, displayed on the wall are these uh, graphics and things. And, and I see Dr. Martin Knox knocking, uh, nodding, not knocking, but nodding, um, about the progress the school is making towards uh, its uh, identified uh, goals. So what I'm thinking is there's an elementary school and there is a middle school. Now, whether there's a high school that sort of meets that, but 
whether it's those two or, or whatever, but I mean, maybe Kathleen has a, a good idea with regard to case studies because we have so many schools, we don't need to know about all of them, but perhaps there's something in how those uh, elementary, middle, and high school are um, focusing on meeting their school progress plan that uh, can be of assistance in the questions that my colleagues uh, have. But I saw that folks, our presenters here, had something they wanted to uh, add. No, sir. Okay, well, all right, that's okay. Uh, that, and that's fine, too. But I know our, our student member had uh, something she wanted to say. Well, I wanted to comment on your comment about the ever-changing ever culture, Mr. Ufelder. That is very true. We are, my, what is it called, 2019 is totally different from 2020, which is totally different from 2019. So when I usually sit back and think about how do you tackle the person-to-person -person issue, the class-to-class -class issue, it's one of those perplexing questions that is like, how do you truly tackle them? Because the way we use social media is probably different from the way they're using social media, which is probably going to be different than the way a second grader right now is using social media. So it's one of those, when we look at these policies, do we look at it as a policy that hopefully will affect in another two years the generation that will be affected, or is it more of a just today issue? Well, sometimes folks used to discuss uh, uh, differences in generations, but I see our student member has reminded us that there can be differences within three adjoining years. <laughs> Uh, that, that could also be present. Well, uh, I see that our time is it's, it's fast approaching uh, what we had scheduled uh, for us to discuss. And while there are policies that are um, not as uh, verbose as 5550 and 5560, um, I think we should perhaps move to focus more on, on our steps going forward. Uh, Kathleen, is there something you wanted to add? Go ahead. I was just thinking when you were talking about case studies, uh, perhaps a smaller high school Lock Raven High School might be considered for a case study. Um, I mean, Perry Hall is our largest school. That might be a little more difficult, but I was thinking perhaps one of our smaller high schools like Lock Raven, just to consider. So, well, thank you. Uh, so then in terms of next steps, um, we have some maybe 20 minutes, but um, if in fact there's a, a sense among the committee members that there's information that would better inform our view about 5550 and 5560 from which uh, the host of policies and the binders before us emanate, um, would uh, the members uh, consider that uh, our next meeting, um, in adva well in advance of that meeting, the information that can be gathered uh, along the points outlined uh, would better inform our questioning and our decision making with regard to the review of these of these discipline policies, given that we actually began our review a month early, and now we've had the opportunity to actually talk uh, in a in a public huddle, if you will, about where to go next. Uh, is that the sense of my colleagues um, that uh, we uh, have uh, some? Uh, return, which I guess then asked a very practical question, Dr. Martin Knox, based on your knowledge, your training and experience, and your willingness to assist the Policy Review Committee, the uh, areas of requested information, do you believe that that information can, in some instances, be readily made available to members to review and give your best professional effort to uh, provide us with some, some other information as requested? I can look into that information for you, yes, sir. Very good. Um, board members, you may have some questions uh, for Dr. Martin Knox based on her um, uh, uh, willing comment. Yes, Kathleen? I would just also like to state that I do agree um, in coming back to all of this at our next PRC meeting, because I do think it would be good to get uh, the input from Mr. McDaniels, who's not able to be here tonight because of other uh, um, commitments. Um, he's been on an equity committee on Maryland Association of Boards of Education, which was discussed at the conference um, that we just attended, and so I'd really like him to be involved. So I think that would be a great idea, as well as more information being gathered. Um, perhaps we should, the questions that we already had developed, email them to you, and you could email them, because maybe they're similar ones that could be grouped and dealt with. Um, is that a possibility? 
I think that's I think that's certainly um, a doable. In fact, I, I don't see that uh, being much of an issue. I would ask that um, that Ms. Clark, uh, who also provides uh, staffing to our committee and our general counsel, be included in in the emailing of the questions. Go ahead, David. Yes. I have a question. I'm just looking at the uh, various policies, and and I don't know of any data that I've seen, but my question is. The various policies, other than 10 and, um, and let's see, 50, um, do we know how many incidents of violation of, let's say, 5520 we have had? Is that in any way, shape, or form being kept by school? As I, I know with the suspension report, but the suspension report doesn't tell you why. If I may just add, 5520, for those who may not know, is student dress code. Just a question. Are we, in other words, I don't want to spend a disproportionate amount of time when, when, uh, where we've had four incidents in a school year out of 114,000 kids, and we're going to spend a lot of time, you know, going over something, or, or even uh, possession of tobacco or, or, or in other words, the violations of any of these policies, do we keep any data on, on how many incidents based on violation? They may or may not cause suspension. That's not my, my point is how relevant is some, are some of these policies to what we have to do? Well, I was going to say um, in terms of the student dress code that I just, would, I yeah. that um, in a schoolhouse, they could monitor just to determine if it is a concern that needs to be reiterated with the parents and with the community. But at this point, I do not know of any data collection regarding um, certain aspects of the, uh, unless a child, it, unless it results into a suspension. Well, okay, that, that's my point. The, the, you know, the, the school, individual schools keep some record as to the reasons for suspension and they're applicable to what policy? Uh, I don't know. I'm just asking the question. Only if it results in a suspension. So, um, so suspensions, we, we, we could get information on suspensions relative to, to how um, they were, uh, the suspension was in relative to a specific policy, a violation of some policy, and that would be at a school level. No, no, but you have to have a reason for suspension. I That's correct. That. Um, the categories are outlined in the handbook, so it would be by the categories identified in the handbook, not necessarily by the policy itself. Um, the handbook is aligned to the policy, if that makes sense. The handbook is aligned to the policy. Um, but um, I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> But when students are suspended, it, it's coded by a specific category okay. um, can, within can we, can the category. a compilation of by, is, is it possible? I don't know. Do we have that data by school, by category? I'd just be curious. To, I know we got level one, two, and three, but because um, I'm, I'm just worried about spending too much time on something that's insignificant, in ter not, not that it's insignificant, in, in the overall picture. You know, we're spending a lot of time dealing with something. Yeah, everything that we have is aligned to the actual offenses. So um, that's how the data is collected. Um, Are we collecting it centrally, or is that just by school? I don't know. I'm just a question I'm throwing out there. It's in the suspension report. So the reports that you receive, that's how we get the, the data. I do believe your data is given by number of incidents or occurrences. It doesn't say the, the, what the type of occurrence or that's incident correct. was. That's what correct. I, what I've read in the past, I mean, if there's a, uh, if that report is done in another fashion, uh, we don't, I haven't seen it, but it may well be. That That's the only one. The one that you get is the one that we generate right. first David great question because it is. Per perhaps there's another dimension to this that's that's um, the other side of the policy which isn't the rule but really the data we collect about the policy yeah that's a great question David thanks so much so that's what I'm hearing, and uh, it appears that staff can can uh, put their hands on uh, some of uh, some of the useful information without overcommitting you. And I know you'll make your you'll give your best efforts, and the sooner you can uh, share that with us, or if there you're running into something that look this isn't this isn't the the hundred percent that you've asked for, but this is what we can more, most immediately get our hands on and get to you in a readily digestible way. That you know I'm happy to share that with uh, with uh, my colleagues as well.
Not, not, nodding is the right answer. There you go. Okay. Um, do any of my colleagues then have any objection to us then proceeding in that fashion for our next meeting with regard to uh, the policies? If there is a way then to prioritize, fine. If not, the default is 5550 and 5560 under the idea that other policies are emanating from there. And if there's work that's done on 5550 and 5560, then uh, that will then have to continue since we've been in business since the mid-1800s. Does that work? I see you raising your eyebrows. Is that, is that as an affirmative? Um, um, uh, that having been said, then is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much to staff.